so uh, feel free to, I guess, uh, you know, post your questions in the chat box and, or if you have any questions, you can also raise your hand or interject uh, and simply just shout at me. Uh, I'll be happy to sort of like answer your questions and you can make this as informal as possible. Although I did sort of like prepare, you know, a presentation so that in case, you know, the, the awkward silences become unbearable, uh, there's something to fall back on, right? Uh, but nevertheless, I really do encourage sort of like uh, active conversation. Uh, so, Selamat Sejahtera, Salam Alaikum, everyone. Uh, uh, I guess, you know, uh, like all uh, good museums today that are invested in ideas of sort of social justice, I would like to acknowledge the Orang Orang Asli, Asal, and Lao, the traditional custodians of the lands and sea that we meet on today. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge uh, any of the Orang Orang Asli, Asal, or Lao joining us today in uh, uh, the talk. I'd like to thank Yusra and the UCSI team uh, for organizing uh, the sharing. Uh, and, and, and it's exciting to be part of this conversation about our past. So let's start by uh, clearing our, let's let us first clear our vision so that we may see clearer. So in 1920, in early 1921, a statue of Ganesha elephant uh, was discovered in the borderlands of Sarawak, sandwiched between two halves of Brunei, an area combined. The figure was uh, almost immediately excavated, brought to the Sarawak Museum, where uh, a photograph of the artifact was taken. Uh, in the form of the photograph, the image circulated around the world. It entered into a scholarly conversation that really tried to figure out its place within history. So experts from all the way to from Netherlands to India were weighing in and making different sort of comparisons right, uh, with the objects that they had in their collection. So they came to the conclusion that the image representing Ganesha in this kind of like seated meditation posture uh, ultimately falls within a kind of stylistic genre that was not found in India and really only similar to uh, some of the Javanese examples that was, uh, that's currently stored in, the, in an Indian museum collection. So at the same time, uh, a very different kind of excitement gathered around the object that was displayed in the museum. So when thousands flocked to the museum to take a look at this you know, new historical find, uh, the museum attendants uh, became quite amused. Uh, uh, because uh, when they saw what the crowd was doing, they were engaging with the Ganesha statue in a very different way. Uh, offerings were placed in front of the statue. Uh, people were obviously interacting with the statue as if uh, it's an object of religious rever reverence. Uh, moreover, as you can see in this detail here, uh, of the, the, that very photograph of the, the Ganesha statue, uh, a copy of it was was actually given to the Sikh temple in Kuching, presumably upon the community's request for a copy. So what can we make of this history? Now, for one, I think it suggests that while it is common to assume that when an object from another culture enters a museum space, their meaning, purpose, and context are totally transformed, there are also accounts that suggest that these transformations are not always uh, uh, total. If the Ganesha statue was created originally for the purpose of religious worship, then when it enters a museum, we see the object through a different set of interpretive frames. So in this case, it might sit as an artifact among other religious statues, representing the artistic cultural achievement of a particular community, or perhaps recording a historical momentous event of a society. And moreover, rules and etiquettes uh, then regulate how we are supposed to interact with these display artifacts as visitors of a museum, right? And typically, you will uh, be familiar with the no touching policy, or you know, stand at the correct distance, or no flash photography. Uh, of course, these are sort of like changing sets of, sort of regulations and etiquettes. Then, then you have the set of uh, information labels or wall text that dictates. Uh, what is the most appropriate way to understand the exhibited artifact? 
So in doing so, uh, I think uh, when viewed through this lens, we, we expect that the Ganesha statue uh, to would lose its function as a murti, or what I mean here is that as a statue of a as, as a statue with religious sort of power of a deity operating within a religious religious worldview that recognizes that the statue is not just an inert object, but also has the capacity to bestow blessings upon the reciprocal exchange of sight or what is called darshan, when a worshiper looks upon the statue and the statue of the icon in turn returns the deity's gaze at the worshiper. But, and so uh, therefore, uh, if we think that this function has been entirely lost, uh, I think the example that I've highlighted to you suggests that maybe uh, something else is going on, you know? It's not entirely sort of like one or the other. Uh, so who are these throngs of people who so flagrantly disregarded what is the proper way to visit the museum? To get a bigger picture, we might have to turn to available statistics. Uh, so I'm too lazy to go and find early 20th century statistical data. So this is from a later period, and it, it's a breakdown, for, uh, although from a later period, but I think it gives you a rough idea that while statistics itself might not tell us a lot about what a visitor might think or reflect on uh, at an individual level, uh, it makes very apparent that the museum has always served a very multicultural and multi-ethnic demographic. And it is not difficult to tell that the majority of the museum visitors are decidedly non-European. So I guess for me, uh, this is where it gets interesting. Museums emerges out of the uncertainty of a changing world sometime in the 18th century. Uh, and where, whereas uh, this article here you see on the screen from 1947 suggests, uh, or already it's suggesting that, you know, old custom crafts and arts are dying out rapidly in some areas. And in the case of Sarawak, one of its curator uh, calls the founding of a museum an unassuming sort of ambition. Uh, so actually, when you think about it, it's not as unassuming as it seems. This ambition, however, uh, uh, it is after all not as unassuming. After all, uh, as in the same article, it is suggested that uh, Harrison, the curator then, spoke of the museum having a kind of aspiration towards a comprehensive display. Uh, a comprehensive display uh, covering the whole of Sarawak and Guna, culture and life. So collectively, the exhibition and storage of culture and life serve two purposes. The first function uh, in the form of the museum exhibition is mainly aesthetic, educational, and entertaining. The second function, however, in the form of a research collection is uh, serving a scientific and informational purpose. Um, I'm quoting him on this sort of like uh, description. And all in all though, Harrison, uh, as new curator, then seems to be saying in a very excited manner, the museum is really a rich treasure house of history and adventure. So there's, I think, a reason for this uh, very overly enthusiastic heart cell. And one detects that when Harrison was, you know, fighting very hard for the museum's relevance, which suggests that after the Second World War, public perception of the museum had changed somewhat. It was seen as a place that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that dwelt too much in the past or, or couldn't keep up with the times. It was a place where things go to die. Harrison argued, however, that contrary to public opinion, a museum is a living institution. And he used the term living museum to describe what he was trying to create. Giving the example of how knowledge that was amassed in the museums History allowed the museum curators to help a girl, a, a, a girl, a Kuching Girls Guide group to create a nature batch task. So it's kind of like an, uh, they, they used that kind of knowledge to create a kind of activity where, as a Girls Guide, you can earn a batch 
for demonstrating understanding of a local knowledge. And this is something the wow birds of Kuching. Uh, but more importantly, however, uh, when he pointed to this example, he suggests that the curators too were learning from the girl's guide, speculating that perhaps in figuring out the birds of Kuching uh, through uh, this exercise, uh, they might one day uh, be able to develop a special display case focusing on Kuching's natural history rather than the whole of Sarawak. So, and in Tom Harrison's view, then therefore the role of a museum was many, in many ways uh, much ahead of the, its time. He was already speaking out to a wider trend to revitalize uh, the educational role of museum. But I think in his call for a more inclusive approach to running museums, uh, this would only gain momentum much later in the 1970s. Firstly, through the whole echo museum movement that later clarified in uh, in the following decade uh, 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 in, with the term new museology. So briefly put though, uh, when you say that there's this new approach to running museum or, or, uh, or thinking about what the museum's role is, uh, people who promoted this sort of like new approaches uh, tend to sort of like, uh, uh, tend to promote greater awareness of the social and political role of museums within a society. And this encompasses uh, how they can engage meaningful community participation as part of the interpretation and knowledge production of the museum. So uh, in doing so, while the call for greater inclusivity has become central to the discussion of the role that museum is supposed to play today, this attitude, I think, in this way of sort of like thinking about questions of inclusivity, about who actually has the right to interpret the museum and where can you discover this, uh, uh, all these other voices other than the curator's voice that tends to be the most authoritative voice on how to read or understand what is being displayed, right? So how do we sort of then apply this sort of like way of thinking to look at museums of the past is what I'm interested in, uh, you know, so that we turn away, the, so that we don't sort of like think that the colonial museum is only made up of one voice, and that is the voice of the expert. And in turning away from the voice of the expert, let's see what we can learn from voices that emerge from the crowd. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. So, all right. So let's take a little detour. First, a bit of history. Uh, so the museum grew out of really what is called a cabinet of curiosity or in the German word it was called a Wunderkramer, right? a wonder cabinet. So the term cabinet originally describes a room where objects recognized for their very strange or exotic, strange form or exotic value were collected and displayed by those who are very wealthy or those who are politically powerful uh, during the 16th century onwards in Europe. So many of these private collections serve uh, different agendas. Uh, uh, it could, on the one hand, be used to entertain important guests, to uh, another, on the other hand, to uh, use to sort of like establish uh, one social rank or social position within society by saying, hey, I've got, you know, resources, I've got Luban to sort of like, you know, bring all the, uh, you know, collect these things and find all these things. I've got people out there doing the sourcing for me. Or it could also be some way of demonstrating uh, one is like knowledgeable uh, or in, in, in intelligent. So the museum really uh, uh, developed out of this social practice, this earlier social practice that, they, that dates back to the 16th century. And uh, one example, one early example uh, in the uh, 17th, uh, late 17th century, early 18th century was when a, when a collector of fossils shells and animals began to open his own home near Manchester to anyone interested in doing the collection. And this was done initially free of charge, but it became an instant hit. And recognizing the demand uh, and being a capitalist at heart, he decided to uh, turn it into a commercial venture, move the collection to London and started charging an entrance fee. Uh, so uh, out of these sort of like private ventures, that uh, responded to the demands of the market. Uh, 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 
I think uh, there were the, this market was also something that was increased, uh, that was uh, extremely volatile, uh, as much as it was a robust market. So people make a lot of money, but people also lose a lot of money. And therefore, a lot of these sort of like private collections, even if they went on show or were private museums, did not sort of like survive the test of time or were later absorbed into other uh, 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 government sort of like uh, funded institutions, okay, or museums. So the shakeup really saw, you know, the rise and falls of fortune. And, you know, that's also the beginnings of sort of colonial explorations and settlements. There's also technological innovations that contributed to social change. U European universities then began to amass a collection and serve as a significant sort of intellectual node uh, for uh, where the world was slowly being mapped out and things were being collected. Uh, so all social hierarchies as a result began to also crumble, uh, resulting in many royal collections uh, becoming or uh, being transferred into public hands, forming what was the nucleus collection of what would later be known as the National Museum uh, from the 18th century onward. So whether this is a revolutionary republic or a reformist constitutional monarchy, over the course of the 18th and early 19th century, many collections shifted from the private hands into a new kind of public ownership. And this took the form of a national museum, okay? So while these things were happening in Europe, we often assume nothing else is happening uh, in other places where modernity hasn't reached our shores, uh, or that's what we like to believe, right? Uh, however, I think scholars are increasingly challenging this view and recognizing that if we say that colonial encounters uh, and colonial, colonialism was really a global phenomenon, then we need to study it from other advantages of positions, recognizing that developments uh, that were also happening elsewhere were just as crucial in giving us another way to look at this thing, this period in history. So in Southeast Asia, for example, when, you, when it comes to the museum, or uh, uh, the museum light -like initiative, an early example uh, saw this guy that you see on the screen here, doesn't look very handsome, uh, kind of like a grumpy looking uh, figure by the name of Georges Everhardus Rumpius, uh, weird name, establishing a, uh, and he started a cabinet of curiosity in Ambon uh, at, uh, that's, that belongs to the Maluku Island or the Moluccas then. So from Ambon, he would begin classifying uh, uh, you know, different various kinds of animals and plant lives and, and, and build up his uh, uh, cabinet of curiosity uh, and would publish a sort of like books out of, uh, you know, his findings and research. And if in the past, uh, this image that you see here on the screen has pretty much singularly captured uh, most of our imagination that, uh, you know, Rumpius is this lone solitary figure out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by specimens that he has collected. I think today scholars are beginning to pay attention to uh, uh, another way of uh, understanding how he is located uh, within a, 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 a new social world that he found himself in. So uh, uh, as a result, scholars would sort of like pay attention to other materials that have survived, including this drawing that was found in uh, uh, one of sort of like Rampier's, uh uh, diary uh, or journal, uh, which is likely a depiction of him out on the field. So, you know, he's still wearing his European uh, outfit. So pretty hot uh, uh, to be sort of like dressed like that. But notice uh, that hidden, you know, almost sort of like camouflage among, uh, 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 next to the tree is this uh, uh, dark skin looking guy uh, on the bottom left who seemed to be actually the one doing the collecting work, right? Rather than Amphis who is standing there and writing uh, in his notebook. So sources like this uh, are offering new sort of evidences and, and new ways to really rethink uh, how Rampius himself was actually relying a lot also on local guides uh, to help him make sense of what would be actually an entirely new and strange world to him as he uh, came over here all the way from Europe. 
but you know, as the world sort of change, uh, but you know, this kind of world uh, ultimately sort of changed. So if then uh, there was a lot more sort of like interaction and collaboration and, and very often we sort of like, uh, there's a new way to describe this kind of like knowledge that came out of it. Uh, so rather than calling it, uh, you know, a European sort of like way of classifying or seeing the world, scholars are beginning to say that maybe this is a kind of hybrid knowledge. But um, I think as much as that we can sort of like try to debate uh, about uh, uh, what is the right way to sort of like frame uh, uh, different uh, different uh, voices, uh, different sort of like uh, people that participated in all these scientific activities. Uh, one thing is for sure is that by 19th century, these opportunities increasingly became narrower and narrower, okay? So, uh, but as the world changed, but the world really sort of like changed. And this is uh, a contemporary map of how many museums there are in the world today. In a way, what I like to sort of like suggest here, this is really a horizon. <clears throat> and the horizon moreover has a really long imperial route. So over the course of the 19th century, <clears throat> European powers uh, expanded their whole over different parts of the world. Uh, extensively. So what happened is that <laughs> essentially they carved out most of the world <clears throat> into competing regional networks where formerly sovereign states had to demonstrate loyalty to uh, one of the competing uh, uh, European empires. Uh, so the museum we are most sort of like familiar with that continues to exist today uh, really comes from this period of high imperialism uh, originating in the late 19th century. There early, there's one more earlier sort of like example, but in the interest of saving time, I'm not gonna sort of bring it in. Uh, and, and here uh, we see the conversation that drove much of uh, the discussion around hybrid knowledge uh, uh, of an earlier period now begins to sort of like, you know, fade into the, uh, fade away. Uh, in its place, uh, a much more authoritative uh, knowledge system began dictating knowledge as an imperial science, where over time, uh, it developed an increasingly rigid system of classification and categorization, categorization uh, really to help map out how we, what we can know about the world and how we can know about the world. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, trees would be sort of like classified according to different sort of like species or different uh, genus and uh, different sort of like hierarchies of sort of like value. <coughs> birds will, uh, different kinds of like birds will also be sort of like, you know, packed to a specific sort of like box and even humans as we know it. And we have words like homo sapien that's used to sort of like distinguish humans today as opposed to an Indian at all. Uh, so uh, all these sort of like classification system uh, is part of a, uh, what the museum contributed to, along with uh, you know the development of more precise uh, type of mapping technology, as well as the census. So picking Banchi, you know, counting how many people lives in this area, how many percentage, all these things began to act with a kind of authority and determine. Uh, it be became the language and determine how we 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 are able to know ourselves. Okay, and, and this con. This is, a, this is a huge sort of like network of scientific staff, right? Uh, 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 where the past is then sort of like turned into some kind of uh, spectacle for the consumption of people who are modern. And, and, and also then culture is uh, measured according to this new kind of value system, which is called civilization. So we, we normally think of civilization as, you know, uh, we call someone barbaric if uh, uh, they, they, uh, they live in a cave and, uh, or uh, civilizes if they live in a house, right? Uh, so all these sort of like ideas, these kinds of like stereotypes where we measure people according to a set of value system that's already been predetermined uh, by uh, an European sort of like idea of what is the hierarchy of progress. So there are criteria that you take in order to say that you're civilized. And, and this would include, uh, you know, we have a very sort of sophisticated, uh, you know, art, art, artistic sort of uh, culture, or you, know, you have, a, you know, a robust literary scene. And, and if you sort of like take out the box, you're closer to the, you, you know, to, to, the, to the civilized world, as opposed to 
the barbaric or the savage or the primitive kind of like world. So then, you know, different cultures are packed according to this kind of uh, measurement scheme. Uh, but I think uh, 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 you, you, then you see this being sort of like, I guess, in some ways, uh, uh, absorbed and also uh, uh, internalized on some level uh, in especially sort of like uh, publications in vernacular language or local languages. So in Majala Guru, which is a, a, a magazine that is written in sort of a publishing Jawi, uh, you find that, uh, uh, for example, uh, there's this discussion about sort of like the museum as a place that uh, uh, all things were sort of like kept, but uh, then it, uh, the person, the author launches into a kind of like discussion that, uh, you know, if we were to sort of like, uh, uh, if we don't copy people, we would be like the Sakai or, or the Orang Asli because they don't copy people, they become wild, all right? But if we copy and we're, we're good at copying, we will one day become sort of like uh, progressive and modern that other people wants to copy us as well. Uh, and so then you sort of like put yourself in competition with other sort of like group of people uh, to see where you are located within this sort of like hierarchy of community. So a lot of this sort of like way of thinking then begins to seep into also how we then measure uh, what is the, our, our own sort of cultural worth. Uh, so, uh, but of course, I think uh, within this, so this is a very sort of like complex world and I'm going to introduce all this sort of like complexity by saying that, okay, there's that, but then there's also like, uh, you know, uh, scholarship that really tries to uh, 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 challenge the stereotype of, of how we understand a particular sort of like uh, cultural community. Uh, so for example, in Jennifer Morris' uh, PhD research, she was really sort of like trying to find a different way out of the normal stereotype where we normally think of the Ibans during the Brook uh, administration over Sarawak or the Brook sort of like rule over Sarawak, uh, typically they are seen only as warriors or headhunters. But she did all the statistical sort of like research to find out that that's actually a huge sort of like network of professional class, not just Ibans who work in uh, Sarawak itself and, and serving the, uh, the civil service or working in the civil service, but they, was, they began to spread out across Southeast Asia, principally working as scientific collectors. And it's not uncommon if you were to read all the old museum reports that you would find uh, mentions of like, you know, an Iban, or they call it a Daya employee, but it's an Iban employee uh, working for, like, you know, the Slangon Museum or the Perak Museum. Uh, notable person would be someone like uh, uh, Lajang Ganisang, who is like a collector from Saribas, but made his way all the way to Thailand and was part of a voyage that went to the US to transport animals and specimens to the National Museum there. And then of course, Google celebrated uh, the 100, 102's, uh, 102nd birthday of uh, uh, the, I think the first local curator of the Sarawak Museum, Benedict Sandin, uh, recently by honoring him with, uh, you know, this, uh, this graphic image uh, on their homepage. Uh, uh, so all these things uh, suggest that I, I guess uh, there were also uh, uh, attempts to sort of like write uh, uh, local scientists or local participants uh, at the center of this sort of like scientific research and activity. But I think uh, ultimately we have to uh, recognize that when we talk about participation, that your capacity to participate in a discourse it really sort of like opens up a person to the risk of uh, being complicitous or being uh, or the risk of complicity. So, uh, and this is best sort of like seen in this 1931 uh, 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 report of his visit of, of this person's uh, Shippo uh, Moss visit to the Raffles Museum, where he saw a, Malay, uh, a diorama or a model of a Malay mother having just gave birth and laid her child on her lap. The author then observed that the, oh, the, the forehead of the child was restricted by a thin metallic board or a kind of like band, uh, which he then deduced to have constricted the intellectual growth of the Malays on, on the whole, thereby slowing down their progress or, or their capacity to modernize. But then he, he nevertheless said that, oh, this could 
be just a customary practice. And if we change the old habits, then the person would be like everyone else. But then again, then he started doubting himself again and suggesting maybe environmental factors such as the tropical weather to really wear down, you know, human's capacity to be hardworking and all this kind of thing. Uh, so there's a, there's a very sort of like strange uh, uh, back and forth where he's trying to sort of like think through something he don't quite understand, but also then uh, heavily borrowing on sort of ideas that are very prevalent then. And of course, ideas that he needs to sort of like engage with. But, uh, you know, if you want to try to redeem even something uh, as, uh, slightly racist uh, like this, is that we, we want to sort of like, what we can do is then to begin to recognize that when he questions himself, he's almost playing the role of a Socratic subject in a very dialectical kind of performance, right? Where he's using doubt to productively sort of like, uh, uh, question all the assumptions uh, that he has made. And so he keeps, he keeps sort of like critically questioning himself over and over and over again. And this is a new kind of like attitude uh, uh, that you begin to sort of like see as people uh, begin to write more about uh, the engagement with the modern world uh, during the early 20th century. So, and thinking aloud and looking at things. So let's look at what the crowd is looking at, okay? Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, one way to sort of like go about it is to sort of approach it uh, by trying to see if there are local th terminologies and voices uh, of non-expert that have different ways uh, in which we can understand the way they engage with the museum. So here local references point to voices from a broader public, uh, not just those who participate within the curatorial discourse of the museum, such as uh, you know, a, a scientific collector or a, a museum curator, right? Uh, or, or, a, or a local person who became eventually a museum curator. So the challenge is that sources are scanned uh, and in different languages. Uh, but I would also argue the huge challenge is uh, doing this kind of like research. I think it is only maybe a bit more meaningful if you approach this through a multicultural lens. And maybe this requires us to really uh, work collaborate, uh, to, to find collaborative partners who can read different languages. So I want to sort of like figure out what are the uh, things that were say in sort of Tamil publication, for example, a language I don't read. So to track this conversation that speaks back against the universalism of European knowledge system, uh, really we need to also sort of like think of how they're not just sort of like speaking back against European knowledge system, but how they're also speaking to one another and listening across language borders and boundaries. And this I think is very important because we're, we're beginning to see as much as these borders and, uh, and divisions are being sort of like put into place because uh, we begin to see the world according to race or ethnic group or things like that. But uh, 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 people are also sort of like figuring ways uh, in which they begin to sort of like build solidarity across these divides. Uh, so uh, what you have see here on the screen is one example of like say a local expression or local terminology used to describe uh, a museum. So typically in Batavia or Jak Jakarta today, uh, part of Indonesia, uh, in the past in the 19th century, uh, the museum was called a uh, Gedong Gajah or the two words for it, Gedong Gajah or Gedong Acha. So when you say it's a gedung gajah, gedung is like a, a word that translates as a hall, uh, and gajah read really refers to uh, the statue of a, of an elephant uh, that was gifted by uh, uh, King Chula Longkorn of Thailand uh, 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 and, and, and installed in the front lawn. And because it was such a prominent landmark, uh, locals began to sort of like call it gedung gajah to the extent that even when uh, 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 a colonial officer was required to devise, uh, you know, language lesson plans uh, uh, so that to help uh, new incoming uh, officers uh, from Holland uh, uh, to teach them how to sort of like train locals uh, because they need to sort of like speak in Bahasam, uh, Bahasam Layu. Uh, they, uh, one of the examples used for that, okay, uh, if you want to sort of like, if you want to sort of like, you know, tell him, get his, teach him about orientation, you have to teach him that, okay, the museum is the Gedong Gajah, uh, 
uh, because that's what the locals call it or something like that. Yeah, so, so it's already recorded since the uh, 1880s. Uh, that this is a common word used in, in, uh, in place of the word museum, for example. Uh, so from the 19th century onwards, then we begin to sort of like see uh, the acknowledgement of institutions that promote some form of memory practice, but these terminologies were not always sort of like fixed. So sometimes the word museum is used, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, longer description as you saw it says museum yaitu gedung tempat menyimpan barang yang ajaib ajaib dari dari zaman dahulu kala or in the hikai abdullah it's more or like a memorial sort of like hall where he says what kan satu rumah akan menaruh gambar rupa tuan rafael supaya menjadi peringatan pada segala orang bahawa ialah yang telah membuat pekerjaan yang besar itu adanya uh, or in you know uh, the Singapore from to uh, see uh, from also a period uh, so this is like a much more exhaustive uh, description of what uh, this person saw in the Raffles Museum uh, and in fact uh, goes into sort of like quite a detailed sort of like cataloging or listing of the things that uh, you are able to sort of like find there uh, so the different ways in which the museum are sort of like discussed and talked about uh, during this period, but uh, increasingly then, uh, 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 I think uh, scholars felt that uh, in the late 19th century, uh, a new sort of like term then uh, became uh, became adopted. So uh, scholars like Muhammad Tai Potman did suggest that initially the word for museum in the Malay language was called Ajayt Kana, uh, though Arabic origin, it was more likely an Indo-Persian loan term. So Kana refers to a hall or a roof sort of like that during venue, uh, therefore suggesting that the museum was seen to be a kind of hall of wonders, right? Ajayt, a, a hall that contains strange things. But actually I haven't been quite successful in finding other examples other than the, this uh, one that I have on the screen, that Muhammad Taib Osman used. And in fact, when he meant, when this is mentioned in this article, the mention of Ajayb Kana in this case was uh, referring to perhaps a kind of like a exhibition hall that was part of the Chicago World Expo in 1893. So uh, it's not exactly a museum in the sense, in the, in the sense and, uh, and more like an exhibition hall. Uh, so, uh, but, but uh, there might be sort of like, you know, other exa examples of how it's used uh, in, in different sort of like context that Taib uh, Osman uh, might be referring to when he says that the museum is equated with, uh, a, 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 the word museum translates as Azaikana in the early period. Uh, but if that's the case, then uh, it would have very likely uh, reference. It was a reference that took inspiration from the naming of uh, a place like the Lahore Museum, uh, in Pakistan, uh, which is today still known as Ajayib Ga. So those of you who uh, read uh, Jawi will be able to make out that's what uh, it's spelled out here. Up here it says sort of like museum, but down here it's still Ajayib Ga, which is equivalent to the hall of sort of like wonders. Uh, and, and those of you who know your English literature might also know that this was where uh, John Lockwood Kipling uh, was once the curator and, and he was, of course, uh, Maria Kipling's uh, Father. Um, so given that, uh, that the Jawi Pranakan was a newspaper owned by a local Indian, uh, a local Indian Muslim owner and, and part, largely circulated within a local Indian Muslim community, I, my, my guess is that it was likely that the term Ajay Kano was not widely circulated or used. Instead, from the 1890s onwards, is a more widely used term associated the museum with pictures. Or the pictorial, either as rumah gambar or tempat tengok gambar or the scholar gambar. Okay, and uh, I think its appearance in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, uh, almost like you know, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, really brings into question uh, what is a conventional narrative amongst uh, uh, museum study scholarship in Malaysia today that tends to identify the term scholar gamba as a phrase that only gained popularity from the 1950s onwards. And in such an account, uh, a 
a scholar would typically describe uh, scholar gumper as a new kind of cultural orientation for the museum, or a new kind of paradigm, taking an educational turn because of the word scholar that is now used as a sort of like a descriptor for, for, for the institution. Uh, and it reflects a period of political transition. So therefore, a scholar gamba in, in this interpretation was a place where one comes to be schooled uh, and taught and the, med the medium used was the museum. So, uh, but I think historians, when they create a kind of historical timeline like this to track the change of meaning from Ajaykana in the 19th century to Scholar Gamba in the 1950s to museum used in the 1960s onwards is uh, maybe a bit too neat uh, because I think uh, what they do is they tend to sort of like ignore a lot of these other contradicting sort of like information such as, you know, the appearance of Scholar Gamba as early as 1908 uh, or the fact that actually if museum, the term museum itself that we currently use today was not only adopted from the 1960s onward, as early as the 20th century, you find a lot of uh, reference to sort of like the word museum and, and how museum was used to describe the museum. And it seems like both terms, uh, uh, Skola Gamba or Luma Gamba or museum were widely accepted and understood to mean museum used interchangeably, uh, depending on context and depending on who is the person using it. So, so far we have looked at, uh, what, how, how uh, the, the terminologies. So what happens is, and, and, and people who cursorily or in passing mention the museum. So for example, this one, you see the Shair Pejalan Sultan Lingga, uh, you know, Kemudian Berangkat Baginda Ratu ke Lembar, the museum telah tertentu. Okay, he has to definitely go to Lembar in the museum. I don't know what Lembar is, but he definitely has to go to the museum, but I don't think he sounds very excited by it uh, because then he rather goes, uh, 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 to watch the Wayang Parsi later on. So clearly the data holds more appeal compared to the boring stuffy museum uh, for, for the Sultan of Linga. Okay. Uh, but you know, uh, what happens if we find a record that uh, has, takes on a much more reflective kind of character. And one example of this account uh, is uh, Huang Chang, sort of a Chinese general who was ruling, uh, was governing Hainan Island back then when he visited Malaya around 1926, I think. So his daily observations were subsequently published in what he was planning to do was to publish it as a two volume travelogue. Uh, uh, but I think he only uh, managed to print the first volume uh, uh, because uh, people have not found the second volume. And in chapter 30, uh, 53, he this, his his description of the Selangor Museum uh, offers quite a unique non-European perspective. So he begins by noting the prominence of the elephant display at the entrance, behind which are uh, the vitrines, in which he saw a model of a warship that is featured with the word Malaya written on it and a, and a torpedo, right? Uh, he then spent some time explaining the ship's significance, attributing it to the fundraising efforts of Malayan during the World War I. And he also noted how popular warship model is as a museum, museum display, attracting visitors from all corners. So Huang Chiang was less impressed by the two other sections uh, featuring plants and animals. Uh, to, to them, to him, it was boring. Uh, there was also a section on mining, covering on gold, tin, coal mine, and all these things that was okay to him. But he noted that, uh, yes, the information was extensive and educational, but uh, felt that maybe the machines uh, could be demonstrated. It could have been more interactive uh, rather than just uh, existing as kind of like boring models, right? He suggested someone could be there to demonstrate it and all this kind of like stuff. So it suggests that at least from a non-European perspective, Museum was fascinating, not necessarily as a repository of old artifacts, but also as a modern technology, but also for its ability to contain and uh, show off modern technology and innovation. But more importantly, you see this as a person who's dialoguing or having a conversation with museum objects. He's not as passive uh, uh, recipient of knowledge, uh, blindly sort of like taking in whatever that's being said by the museum curator. He's even sort of like making recommendation or how do you want to sort of can possibly make the exhibition much more interactive, right? And this could be sort of like make it uh, much more educational. Uh, all these things that we think of today, uh, you know, this is a 1926 
uh, uh, reflection. Okay, uh, so it, it, it's quite fun when you are able to sort of like find all these little bits of uh, uh, voices that gives you a sense that we're, we're dealing with people who are really sort of like thinking along and thinking through the times that they're living in. Uh, so, which leads to the last point, decoloniality. So we come to the last part and let's take a look at another account. And this is the story of Mas Sutama, probably a Javanese Wong Chile, or what is what's called a little man, is an ordinary person whose voice is recorded in a short story of his visit to the museum found in a textbook used by the Dutch government to teach the Malay language. So he provides a very vivid description, starting with the archaeological sculptures that also gave the Gadung Gaja a second name. And so typically, it's not only known as the Gadung Gaja, it's also called the Gadung Acha. So Acha is sculpture, but sculpture here refers to all the archaeological finds uh, that were actively being excavated then and displayed in, in this very haphazard kind of like manner in the museum. Then, as it happens, he had the chance to meet the curator who he calls Tuan Yang Kuasa di Gedong Itu. So the, it's, it's almost like it translates as ma the master who possesses power over the hall, right? And, and he then spoke of the curator sitting in the office filled with all the jewels of, you know, uh, and, and treasures of now vanquished uh, kingdoms uh, in the Nusantara region. Uh, and di dalam bilik, yang penuh dengan barang pusaka raja-raja di India dari zaman dahulu. He also dwelt on the mode of display. Uh, so you see here, maka barang pusaka itu setengahnya ditaruh dalam almari yang rata dan panjang bertutupkan kelas dan setengahnya ditaruh dalam almari yang terdiri. And then list down where the things come from, Bajar Masin, Jawa, Aceh, Bengkulu. And after spending so much time and then looking at the houses, so all these sort of like miniature houses that he says like, uh, dengan contoh atau taladan rumah kecil-kecil menurut macam rumah sebetulnya. So, so he was very impressed by uh, the, the kind of accuracy of detail as well, even really some miniaturized sort of like version of a person's home. So then, uh, after spending a really long time looking at many things in the museum and addressing himself as a humble to convey his modesty, uh, he concludes his story simply with a one-liner, almost very anticlimactic. He said, uh, lalu pulang ke pondok humble and returns back to his small little hut. So let's take for a moment to think about the contradiction of scale that we're seeing here. So the flimsy ramshackle hut against the sturdy brick edifice of the museum. And for a long time, we've been saying that the cost of having a museum that might contain such an encyclopedic collection of things, such as that which Mas Sutama described, came actually with a very violent and tragic price uh, of, co uh, of colonialism, resulting in, of course, the subjugation of many, many one sovereign people. Uh, while this cannot be disputed, and this is a very important point to raise. I think uh, proponents of, of people who advocate or support uh, movements like decolonizing the museum uh, sometimes might adopt a rather innocent view that the goal of decolonizing the museum it, uh, can simply be achieved by uh, returning the object's uh, uh, meaning in, to its original, returning the object into its original context and, and, and understanding the object uh, meaning so, uh, solely through its original sort of like use or intention. Uh, uh, in doing so, this can help to address the violence of you know, the past. Uh, uh, I think when we sort of like read uh, the museum as being overdetermined by one singular colonial agenda, we often turn our ears and eyes away from other kinds of like voices uh, that was also really sort of like saying something about the museum. Uh, after all, uh, if we sort of like recall Tom Harrison's plea to imagine the museum as a living museum, he calls for a two-way breathing in and out affair. He explains further. Actually, when you think about it, only in the museum or library, you can enter and wander freely anyway uh, and all day. In the process, each section of the community should find out more about others 
and about the Sarawak and about Sarawak as a whole. Uh, so what is happening, sort of what is being sort of like suggested of, or being sort of like suggested here, I think we in many ways mirrors uh, Mas Sutomo's sort of like wandering around the museum by itself. And I, what I find remarkable about Masutomo's wandering is that it doesn't come to any conclusion. Uh, leaving it at that, we are invited to actually dwell on the possibilities uh, that have perhaps opened up before him, uh, before his eyes, as the world that will in the future become an independent Indonesia, when all these things are sort of like collected, you begin to sort of like see, okay, uh, Javanese is next to a bunch of Masin, a person from Baja Masin is next to someone who's like uh, from Sumatra, uh, who's, um, who's next to someone from Aceh. And all these sort of like, oh, who's next to someone from uh, the Maluku Islands. All these people, uh, despite their differences, uh, uh, can sort of like come together. And that in imagining this space where people can come together, uh, uh, they're also sort of like taking a very European concept that is called the nation and changing it slightly to sort of like see if this sort of like new idea, idea of uh, an identity can really accommodate all the different peoples across the Nusantara archipelago coming from different backgrounds and with different sort of like, you know, uh, 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 with different sort of like cultural origins. So we are, I think, therefore we are really at a kind of like crossroad in confronting what we call an imperial legacy, right? Uh, and there are a few paths that have been explored. We could have explored maybe a more anarchistic idea of the anti-state, uh, you know, creating a culture that is more self-sufficient or, or uh, centered on some kind of like self-organization uh, without the reliance of state institution. And, and people, you know, the hippie culture, uh, uh, people who decide to sort of like, you know, give up living in cities to sort of like start their own farm. Uh, all these are sort of like explored uh, on some level, but then when you disengage, then uh, there's still the rest of us who are in this system that need to engage with this system. So, uh, uh, so good for, I think it's, interesting on one level, but it doesn't sort of still solve the problem that this is still an overriding uh, kind of legacy that a lot of us, or most of us, who decides to even sort of like, you know, take a course in architecture or study in a university have to sort of uh, think through or deal with or confront, right? Uh, then there are a lot of effort, especially from the 70s, 80s, 90s onwards, that then tries to recover or reprivilege indigenous knowledge system. Uh, uh, and this then uh, says, it's like, okay, if we have an indigenous worldview, let's sort of like try to recover it. And through recovering this, we are able to then reject, uh, 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 you know, this sort of like Western imposed kind of like knowledge or how, of how to sort of like do things, of how to sort of like think about, you know, at the world, of how to sort of like produce knowledge. Uh, soon, however, I think uh, when entwined with when, very, when this is very closely entangled with the agenda of the nation state, you'll find that a number of projects uh, 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 that we, I can think of, uh, closest example would be uh, the Pantayong Pananao movement in the Philippines, or even in Malaysia, the, the Aref, what is called the Arefan Tempatan, uh, almost very much becomes a caricature of what knowledge production is. Uh, uh, it's as if, it's saying that we can go back to a purer time. And then the risk is that we also might romanticize this pre-colonial past as an ideal, uh, first, as a place that we can actually go back to. And second, that if we go back to that, then all our problems would sort of like be solved and that there wouldn't be any problem uh, if uh, we would manage to sort of like go back there. You know, chances are, you know, the past is only ever better for people who belong, if you have, if you are an orang besar or a tauke, not your everyday person like Masutomo. So he, I don't think he has any qualms about trying to sort of like go back to a past where he's really just an everyday ordinary person, right? Now the pitfall of these projects is that uh, it focuses on you know this idea of redemption that is still that still often retains like you know. Uh, the use of civilization as a measuring yardstick. And this tends to pack certain people or communities within a competitive timeline. 
and, and we see ourselves as racing to become the best, the most cultured, the mightiest, the most powerful, the most intelligent, right? Uh, but I think uh, there are, uh, uh, in, in recent times, two sort of like approach uh, that uh, have, have gained some kind of like momentum. Uh, so the, the first is like uh, uh, Walter Minolo and his area of focus is really on Latin America, uh, where he brings in this concept of border dwelling, meaning focusing on areas that is in the margin of, uh, rather than the center and look out for where the borders are. And uh, in, in, he thinks that it is at the borders that we are able to sort of like find ways to really escape this kind of like um, what he calls the colonial matrix of power, meaning that there is this sort of, if you think of the movie matrix, then it's like, you know, it's a system that sort of like captures all of us, right? And, and speeds us the kind of like illusion that this is reality. But he's saying that there's a way to sort of like escape this reality. And that's if we sort of are willing to sort of like uproot ourselves and go to those border territory and dwell there to find uh, uh, local kind of like uh, knowledge system that continues to exist there. But unlike the kind of Ka'arefan Tempatan or Pantayong Panang now approach to what is indigenous or local knowledge system, the emphasis I think for Minolo is the border, where, where at the border it is really, the principle is not purity or authenticity. Uh, when you live in a border territory, you live in a state of mixture of hybridity or, or being a, a, what we call a, a mestizo, right? A mestizade. Uh, so uh, for him, when you sort of like dwell in the border, you're sort of like dwelling in a space that is always already sort of like mixed rather than a space where you can actually find an authentic, uh, uh, you know, a knowledge of self that is uh, untouched by colonialism. Uh, another thinker then seems to disagree with Nolo and he primarily uh, thinks through Africa as his context. So uh, Achil uh, Mbebe, uh, Mbebe uh, uh, instead he tends to sort of like focus on uh, what he what what is uh, on the possibility of a dialogue between different peoples, uh, different people, those who who who, uh, who are Europeans and those who are non-Europeans, uh, and participating in this transformational dialogue. He believes in the transformation can happen only through dialogue, recognizing that the way forward is really through collaboration and refashioning the world out of what we have, uh, because he don't think that there's anything else out there. There's no other reality other than this sort of like colonial matrix that we're living in. So a recent article actually pits do these two uh, thinkers as like, you know, competing approaches, but actually if we can actually think of them differently and, 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 and I feel it's more productive to consider them, uh, to hold them uh, in our thought as being part of a productive tension. So with Minolo offering a glimpse of a possibility that maybe there are other world out there that still like this. Uh, and rather than think of these as purely authentic knowledge, uncontaminated, we should think of them as outcome of colonial encounters, emerging from a desire to really find a way to resist colonial domination of what we are not. Then with Mbebe, he's offering a much more sober reality, reality check that really maybe there's nothing out, out there. We are really all subjects that were schooled, that we are all scholar. We all went through a scholar in a colonial, uh, European colonial knowledge system. Uh, that, uh, that is very total. Uh, uh, what is left for us to do then is to think of the problematics with the tools that we have inherited uh, and, and we, that we have been trained to use and collaborated with one another to break those boundaries down and discover new possibilities in the process. So let's think of finally how this might translate in a museum exhibition. Ghosts, an exploration exhibition, mystery and culture. So this was like the most popular exhibition that was uh, held in Malaysia, I think. Uh, maybe, maybe recently the Leonardo da Vinci show probably you know, broke the record, but in 2002, it became like a huge sensation, right? Uh, it was an exhibition on Hantu. So, you know, it featured like traditional Malay ghosts like on the Pontiana, the Pulisit, the Polong, and it, was, it also included all the Chinese sign ghosts, like all your Tiangsi and everything. And then uh, it's also like uh, even like uh, 
cultural celebrations like Mexican Day of the Day, uh, Day of the Dead, it was also sort of like included. You know, museum staff have to set up tents to accommodate a long line of people and all that kind of uh, stuff. And uh, in today's sort of like uh, retrospective reading of this exhibition, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, I, uh, this uh, the, a curator by the name of Kamuro, Kamaro Baharin A. Kasim is often lauded as and attributed as the exhibitions curator, exhibitions curator. But actually, if you sort of like dig a bit deeper, it's not hard to find that there are also other people sort of like, you know, contributing to the show. And one of them is this uh, very interesting uh, figure by the name of Paul Paulette Delios. Uh, and she's an Australian girl who somehow found her way around the world and in Malaysia at some point and uh, decided that, okay, Malaysian museums are interesting enough and actually wrote one of the most extensive and critical uh, pieces on the history of Malaysian museum. Uh, and uh, during her time when she was here doing her research, she was also actually involved and assisted in putting this exhibition together. So voices like that uh, often gets lost. But when we sort of like think about you know, Mbebe's call for a kind of like collaboration, I think we need to sort of begin to start to acknowledge uh, the many different kinds of like people that can be part of this conversation rather than only uh, uh, heroicize the local players, okay? Uh, so in a lot of the sort of like post-colonial kind of like discussion, uh, we talk of the museum's interpretive sort of like medium, it's often taught through uh, it's often thought of as something that distorts or obliterates sort of meaning. Uh, in, in, in the museum's role as a reinterpretive sort of uh, channel, it is often said to point to some kind of like passing of the traditional ways of doing things in a society as it rushes towards embracing modernity. But I think what Paulette Delios is suggesting is that maybe this is not always the case since ghosts continue to actively figure within the Malaysian modern urban scape and continue to have popular appeal. So she attributes this, she describes it metaphorically as Kali's, uh, you know, the Hindu goddess Kali. Uh, she has a dualistic sort of like quintessence that cannot be disregarded. So it is a paradox that on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, a ghost exhibition is so popular in, in Malaysia and, and it's comically sort of like captured in a large cartoon where, you know, all the Angmore tourists will go to Masjid Negara, but then the locals will go see the Pamekan Hantu. Uh, uh, in, in, in sort of like, uh, uh, in, in what Delios sort of like, what Delios is saying is that on the one hand, yes, there is uh, maybe, maybe, the museum capacity to sort of like uh, distort and alliterate the original meaning is not as totalizing as we make it out to be. And uh, many different old kind of concerns or different sort of like ways of seeing uh, uh, or interacting with the museum continues to exist. And I've pointed you many different examples from the Ganesha statue to, uh, you know, uh, people engaging with the museum differently by the sort of like uh, local terminologies and local sort of like uh, uh, the local language sort of like words or the word museum, for example. Uh, but I think that what she's suggesting is that there's a dualistic quali uh, quality to, to what is happening here. So uh, on the other hand, the problem is like, you know, with an, ex ex uh, with an exhibition like uh, the ghost exhibition uh, at the museum, uh, after the exhibition was over, it went on a prolonged tour across the country. Uh, and the irony is that the sources that uh, all the sort of like, uh, all, the, all the sources ultimately sort of like came from uh, other, other states, uh, more rural and perhaps uh, uh, more agrarian sort of like uh, states. And this is then repackaged, all the stories are then repackaged except this time, the or, uh, so rather than just take all the source material and sort of like bring it to KL and put an exhibition about it, now it's repackaged and then sent back to the Orang Kampung, uh, who are now the recipients, uh, consumers of this urban center museum's manufactured reality of hunting. Uh, so the museum institution reconfigures meaning and propagates new modes of perception as a result. Uh, uh, so 
on some level, we can't really escape that there is this sort of like authoritative way in which it classifies orders and reinterprets the world. And, and keeping this in mind is sort of like useful, even as we sort of like claim that you know, we are creating more inclusivity, uh, that there is this other kind of like drive that, uh, that is very paradoxical here. And that's what uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paulette Delios is sort of like saying. Uh, and keeping that in mind, I think uh, is helpful because then when you are thinking of designing a museum, uh, a lot of it uh, takes place on the level of rhetoric, uh, what you choose to sort of like uh, say uh, versus how it actually sort of is able to uh, concretely manifest itself uh, in the way people sort of experience a museum. There are two different things. And, and, and as planners of some kind or as designers of some kind, we like to think that when we sort of like design something, it can influence or shape sort of like behavior. But don't forget that uh, uh, there are always people who are not going to sort of like fall uh, fall into your sort of like plan and they're going to sort of like find ways to upset it and, and find ways to sort of like uh, sabotage it and, and find new ways of sort of like engaging with it out of your expectation. Yeah, that's it. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that's quite extensive. I mean, like, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yes. Um, I think I forgot to introduce you, my co, uh, you know, uh, lecturer for the course, Fort Lim. I think Fort Lim, are you here? What? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Just uh, listening uh, closely to what uh, Simon has to say. Yeah, I mean, like I think your uh, amazing. I think the your your collection of uh, you know images that you have in your hard drive. I mean, like you know, or I mean, all this historical references, all the text, you know, uh, the word museum, when it was used, you know, maybe you backed up with all these, uh, in a way, evidence, right? Uh, it, it, it's really great. Uh, I mean, it's uh, such a, such a delight, you know, to hear it and to see it, like, uh, you know, all these in, um, uh, you know, 19th century, you know, newspaper articles, you know, uh, it's really it quite hard to find, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, it's also a skill to sort of like acquire, and it's fun when you're able to when 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 something you know pops up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I I don't know if uh, architects actually do archival uh, research, uh, um, or. Mm you participate uh, or do you sort of like you know undertake some kind of archival research as and when you sort of design a building for example uh, if um i'm not sure actually okay. yeah okay yeah anyways uh uh does anyone has any questions to sign yeah, does any what what do you want to know forensic architecture uses archival methodology oh yeah that's great yeah uh, can you do you want to share more about uh, Yvonne? Do you want to share a bit more about what forensic architecture does? I have a vague idea of you know the kind of work that they do, and I know that they're they have a huge popular appeal, but I don't know beyond that. And do you want to share with the class? Or you can also unmute yourself if you are you're, you're comfortable with that and uh, say something. No. Go, Yvonne. Hey. Oh, yeah, she always is in a noisy room. <laughs> so there is a link in the chat box if you are interested to find is out. Is it the one by E.O. Wiseman? The yeah, it's the E.O. Wiseman's oh, work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There are, I guess, a lot of questions, right? Should I go through them? Yeah. Um, uh, right. I don't know if those are all from your colleagues or if they were collated from students, uh, but what are the efforts today to increase archiving and documentation of antiquities? I think they're, uh, you know, uh, part of whatever the digital economy plan that was recently sort of like unveiled. Uh, and even before that, there's already been a lot of efforts and things have been done. It's just that, uh, they're not very good at sharing it. So uh, the, the part that often gets left out is like the distribution and circulation of what has already been digitized. 
uh, so uh, and it's just sitting somewhere uh, in, in, in government department. So different institutions, of course, have different priorities, and some of them do better than others. Uh, but uh, uh, but generally, yeah, I I think uh, we could really sort of like step up in this area. How do we finance museum? especially in the east state, eastern states, and uh, we didn't see any proper funding models to keep our museums up to date. Uh, okay, I think this is a very loaded question. Maybe uh, we can come back to that. How many museums publish their own collection? In fact, all of them do, actually. Uh, it's just not very visible, maybe because we, uh, partly it's also our fault. We are very selective in what we choose to sort of like recognize or see. Uh, it's a very typical Malaysian way, right? You, you imagine that, oh, it, it, it's not up to a certain sort of like standard that we think is global or international. It's not there. Uh, but actually, if you spend time reading a lot of these uh, uh, publications that's written in Malaysia, it's actually really sort of like good research in there. Um, of course, they also they hit and miss a lot of like not so interesting stuff, but generally, there are also a lot of very serious people doing interesting work. So I don't think it's fair to sort of like dismiss and say, that uh, there's nothing. Uh, in fact, there are, it's uh, heavily sort of like, you know, uh, funded industry uh, by the state and, and, and they do a lot of things. Uh, so uh, it's also a matter of us trying, uh, needing to sort of like at least pay attention to some of these things. Why do museums in Thai country not, do not host books, stores of quality in Thai country? Do not host a part museum experience beats me. Uh, I cannot answer to that. Uh, are private museums legislated and controlled by the Ministry of Culture? Not that I'm aware of, and which museum do we affiliate with globally? And are we engaged in the issues? Uh, I think all of them are actually members of uh, uh, what is called ICOMOS. Uh, ICOMOS. Uh, uh, I mean, all the government unions are members of it, they're signatories to whatever thing that they, you know, they participate in it. And it's not hard to participate in all these supposedly global organization, which are honestly, you know, the, 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 it's not hard to be part of that conversation. It's not hard to sort of like enter into that conversation and, and pretend that they're part of that circle. Uh, the, these are also sort of like organizations that tries to please everyone as, uh, as a result, they end up pleasing nobody, right? Uh, it's just something that you do for fun. Uh, uh, so, uh, Australian women, okay, I, I've shared with you the, the link to the thesis. Um, okay, uh, forensic architecture, the visitors were referred to as Humber. Uh, he refers himself as Humber. Uh, so the busy, uh, that's the Batavia Museum. So he refers to himself. It's, it's, a, it's typical in the Malay, uh, traditional sort of like way of a Malay uh, way of narrating. You call yourself humble. Uh, that's, how we, that's how we speak, right? I mean, uh, like, they refer to themselves as, yeah. yeah, I don't want to say, yeah, yeah. You are humble, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly there's an element of spirituality, you know, like the temple of knowledge, temple of art. Okay. Uh, because the, the okay, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if that answers the question. If not, please continue to uh, also research and grants and scholarships. Well, actually, they do send people out to do, uh, they give out scholarships, and um, JPA does give out scholarships and things like that. Of course, again, it's not very transparent. And funny enough, I think JPA is not very good at uh, posting people with the skill after they funded them back into the museum so that they can actually do something uh, and contribute back to, uh, you know, introducing new ideas to our museum culture. So in terms of how the human resource system works, I think uh, there are still a lot of gaps in there. <laughs> are there possibilities of committee run museums and as a method to expand singular? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, uh, what, what do you have in mind? Like, uh, do you want to sort of like share your experience? Uh, I, you know, community run is an entirely different genre and some of them even don't even call it a museum anymore. Right? Imagine they call themselves an interpretation center and, or, or any other, or in another sort of, uh, with another name. But do you have an example in mind, Clarissa? Uh, 
Um, not necessarily. I was just wondering if there are examples in the context of Malaysia. Uh, like, of course, there is Malaysian Design Archive, but that runs more like an archive. But I was wondering if there are interesting. Oh. Ah. Well, interpretation centers is the the one in Sungai Buloh, right? Right. Uh, no, I think that's a story house or something. Yeah. I don't know. There's so many different names. <laughs> There's actually one pretty interesting, interesting one in Malacca, but then it closed down because ah. yeah, it's a private private museum uh, operated in this man's house, and then like anyone can just visit. But then uh, the sad thing is visitors have been stealing stuff from this person. Yeah, so it closed. So I guess that, yeah, that, that is like. Do you want to share the name when you can, Dennis? Thank you. Yeah, I'll show you the link. Yeah, there's also like a place in Kajang, uh, in near Sinatua, where Kajang, it's run. Kajang Heritage Museum? Ah, Kajang Heritage Center. I think it's, yeah. I mean, yes, it's founded by, I can't remember. Uh, Lee Kim Sin. Like ah, yes, ah, yes. It's founded by Mr. Lee Kim Sin, but I think it's run by volunteers. I mean, like, you know, uh, communities, like, you know, they have guided tours and they take turns in like, you know, uh, keep uh, upkeeping the place because it's, it's, it's basically, well, it's privately run. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they get community of volunteers to maintain uh, the place. It's very small. Uh, yeah. We've been there before. I, I brought my students there before and they were very happy to kind of, you know, uh, share yeah yeah it's uh, about the I think it's more on Sungai Chua or Kajang, Kajang yeah it's the yeah. Kajang Heritage Center yeah I imagine like before you know the pandemic there were quite uh, especially like um, there were a lot of like uh, small community run museums that began to pop up in smaller townships and things like that and people would run it uh, you, uh, you know, on a voluntary basis and that kind of stuff. But I don't think we have a sort of a guidebook or things like that. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, that's something that uh, community museums as well can get together and try to sort of create uh, a manual. Although I think in, in, in our current situation, the manual needs to reflect uh, the new set of challenges that they possibly are going to face. Uh, Right. Thank you. So, what is the, what defines a living institution? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, sorry, Guma. I, I, I think uh, I'm not very prescriptive in the sense that I try not to pontificate. And, uh, but what I suggested just now was actually a definition offered by uh, Tom Harrison, who was a sociologist. Uh, who was uh, very interestingly sort of like, uh, uh, who initiated a kind of like crowdsourcing uh, sociological research project in the late 30s before he came to Sarawak. And this involves uh, trying to get as many as sort of like 200 to 500 people to record what they did in a single day. So each person kept a log diary and they did some extensive sort of like series of interviews just to sort of like get a sense of when you think of a mass of people. Uh, having a record of what they did at one particular sort of like point in time, or what kind of new sort of like thing, what kind of uh, new uh, ideas about societies you are able to discover from, from having this sort of like crowdsource knowledge. Uh, of course, today we call it crowdsourcing, lab, but back then it was called mass observation. So he was participating in it. And therefore, I think he, he, he adopted that spirit and, and translated it into his, uh, uh, in, he tried to translate that into his museum work uh, when he came over to Sarawak. So, yeah. Do we have examples of uh, crowdsourced funded museum? Uh, well, I, I don't know about in Malaysia, but I think in Singapore, I mean, this then takes on, of course, a very corporate slam. Uh, so like HDB, which causes the like, public housing, uh, uh, body in Singapore that, that builds all the flats. Uh, but of course, everything in Singapore is so privatized and corporatized that then they would uh, pay the museum a money, some money to do an exhibition on the history of HDB. But through the exhibition, there would be activities where uh, visitors are able to sort of like participate in some kind of like decision making that about planning 
uh, or what what the ideal sort of like you know living environment is like. And through that uh, component, they're able to sort of like gather a huge pool of data that is then sort of like translated and used for whatever new uh, building projects that they're going to do. Uh, uh, you know, undertake in the future. So there's that sort of like, uh, I can think of that as an example of how then this kind of like crowdsourcing uh, method is then sort of like given a corporate sort of like spin, <laughs> even though it's meant for, you know, public housing. <laughs> you know, things are complicated in Singapore. <laughs> Uh, okay, just wondering, like, but so how do you think uh, this evolved to? I mean, um, obviously, museum started off as you said, uh, you know, it's a house of collection, right? Living wonders, not living a hall of wonders. But I, I think uh, I was questioning that um, that meeting because I honestly I can only really find one source, and everyone seems to be referring to that one source. Everyone quotes Tai, Tai only quotes one source. No, I couldn't find any other sort of sources. No, okay. that, that, that's a that's a term that was even used. All right, but but I was wondering how do we move on that? I mean, like, uh, well, museum is to kind of preserve this. It, it's more. It's very much artifact. You know, mm. uh, artifacts based in the past. Mm. So uh, what 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 about our kind of intangible? Uh, so element? let's go about you know trying to preserve. I think. Uh, we can really start to sort of like, I think in, in all of these instances, uh, even with like, you know, the Pamera Hantu, or uh, when we look back at the history of like uh, the National Museum here, you find that uh, the, the, there's a lot of like creativity uh, when it comes to sort of like uh, the, the curator, when, when it comes to the curatorial sort of like projects that they undertake. And often these get sort of like forgotten in favor of, uh, you know, the architectural or the or the more traditional sort of like uh, uh, things that uh, the museum is supposed to sort of like keep, right? So even when we think of the National Museum, it's very early as they were engaging artists to build dioramas. So artists were given the job, uh, craftsmen were sort of like engaged to sort of create new craft object that then becomes part of the museum collection. So they weren't just looking for things that were old. They were also at the same time engaging with what was happening at that time uh, and across different sort of like, you know, modern contemporary sort of like design. Yeah. The modern artists we brought in to paint the backdrop of a diorama, but uh, craftsperson would be uh, invited to sort of like create a miniature or maybe a, a dais that we would normally carve of, I don't know, a, 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 you know, a traditional palanquin. Uh, used for a circumcision ceremony in Kelantan, which takes the form of a giant bird, right? So those things are a um, uh, 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 part of like, you know, those uh, moments where I feel like the museum is most creative. So whenever someone say that, oh, we need to uh, uh, bring in artists uh, to sort of like work on a collection, it's a, it's a new way of decolonizing the museum or, you know, changing the way we sort of like work with museum, that's only if we adopt a view that in the past, all these sort of like creative activities hasn't even, wasn't even explored. Uh, but if they were explored, then maybe it's also, part of it is also to learn from what has been done in the past so that if we were, were trying to sort of like devise, uh, you know, something creative, uh, include a more sort of like creative uh, component into the way we think about curatorial work or we think about the collection, then we have references to sort of fall back on and build on and learn from mistakes that, you know, uh, uh, that we can learn from. And also that we might really sort of like push this practice a little bit further uh, than rather than starting from scratch again. Okay. Uh, any, anyone else has any uh, question? You can pick up, you can tie. Uh, I, I mean, I have one. I mean, like, um, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, you mentioned about, you know, how the National Museum, you know, had dioramas to, you know, uh, kind of 
no, how does it not reframe? Uh, yeah, to 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 capture what was our history, like national history, you know. Uh, so even like you know our Malacca Museum, you know, does the same thing, right? They have dioramas depicting how Malacca came about. But what, what do you think? I mean, um, uh, like how our and narration is framed because I mean, like in terms of how Malaysia uh, was, I mean, this is a bit and not about museum, but how Malaysia was, uh, not Malaysia, uh, Malacca and all that was formed. And then, you know, our history is based on all these hikayat or all these uh, hikayat Melayu and, you know, and they were actually copies of, uh, copies of, what do you call, Sulalat Ustalati. So, mm -hmm. And they're, they're not really historical writings uh, as it, because the writing is mixed with myths and legends and facts. Yeah, so... Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think the museums here, they tend to sort of still, you know, adopt whatever sort of like Western, uh, this European sort of knowledge system that, uh, that most of us are familiar with. So if they try to sort of like mount an exhibition on lack of history, they will do their sort of, uh, they will rely on the discipline of history as uh, and the rigor mm -hmm. of like all the methodology, you know, they do the fact check and stuff like that, and not just look at uh, you know the manuscript. Uh, so during mm -hmm. like, uh, I, I think that's the general sort of like sense of how things are run. So uh, th I think the more sort of um, maybe. Uh, interesting sort of like thing to think about is whether uh, if we can then sort of like find a creative way to sort of bring, uh, uh, to, to, uh, you know, I, I don't know if like the curators can find a creative way to then sort of present uh, the Sejara Malayu in a way that offers maybe overlapping or competing sort of like ways of thinking about history, uh, mm -hmm. but not in a way that saying that uh, okay, so Jeremy Malayu offers the truth, but actually it offers a different sort of like concept of time or a different sort of like understanding of sort of politics and the history, the way we tell history is actually sort of part of how, uh, part of a political sort of culture. And if the uh, if curator is willing to sort of explore that and sort of play creatively on how you, you can sort of select things and put together that, uh, story about the relationship between history and politics, maybe that can be an interesting exhibition. But having said that, that's what the curator does, uh, does right? It tries to tell an overarching kind of story. But what is, when you put things in an exhibition, there's bound to be things that's going to speak differently to you as opposed to what the curator intends for the thing to, to say. If the curator wants the thing to say a certain thing, maybe it might say a different thing to other people. Uh, someone coming with certain, uh, you know, a, a different cultural background will be able to see uh, or, or have a different sort of like engagement with the object there. So it, it's, it's very uncertain. And you show so many things out there, you're never, really sort of, you're never in control of the narrative. Like. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think the uh, uh, huge- but offering, but offering different perspectives. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you can stage a really nice exhibition on, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist sculpture and things like that. But then maybe then suddenly it descends into like a temple when it opens. Uh, so these are possibilities that maybe people don't anticipate or cannot anticipate. But uh, when you create something, uh, invention is one thing, but you release it out to the public, different people will have their own capacity to make meaning out of it. And, 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 and that's where we also sort of like uh, try to recognize the possibilities and limits of uh, someone who plans or do design work. Okay. Uh, we have a question for you from Guma. This is uh, yeah. Hi, to, Simon. To, Thanks. To, yeah. uh, different to spread more awareness in the past, like the Girl Scout example. In your opinion, what are the other ways that museums in Malaysia can do more young people? Oh. Oh, good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I have a fetish or an obsession with the archive. So I always believe that they should uh, make, uh, so uh, I, I always believe that uh, 
and, and, and you can probably, you, you probably got a sense from my uh, talk that I, I, I rather museums show things and do less interpretation for us and then try to sort of like tell us a story. Uh, and the museum sort of like show more things. Actually, each and every one of us can do the interpretive, interpretive work ourselves. And it gives us material to start to uh, have a conversation um, with one another about how we want to sort of like write this story or about the history or culture of Malaysia. Uh, I think that is probably the role that museum should play. And it has historically in some ways played that role, uh, except during the colonial period and the curator then tries to over determine what the meaning of the object is. But generally you got a sense from my lecture that everyone is engaging with those objects in their own way. Uh, and these are examples of how uh, their, their, uh, the public has an agency and, and this agency uh, uh, stems from a, a, a kind of right as well. Right? If we think of the museum as a public space, then this is that we we are we we are uh, we have the right to participate in that conversation. So uh, I, I I'm, I'm sorry, it's a very roundabout way to sort of like say that I don't actually have very specific, concrete uh, kind of uh, suggestions, except maybe uh, because they they already do all these sort of like and school engagement stuff. Uh, my only sort of like suggestion is really open up your archive <laughs> so that geeks like me can, uh, you know, see you, find new, new things. Uh, uh, just wonder what you think about the relevance of museum at this current age. Yeah. True. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a very, very perceptive question. Uh, I think a lot of museums are really, trying to rethink what they can do. And of course, going digital is one and uh, one avenue. Uh, and there are, of course, a lot of limitations to it, but it's also opening up uh, uh, the museum to uh, a new sort of like set of audience that's coming from different parts of the world. Uh, of course, then uh, I think uh, uh, it's also an increasingly crowded outfield, it's becoming increasingly competitive. Every museum is sort of like going that direction, right? So, uh, so the, there's a need to at least sort of like, uh, really think of how, if you want to choose this, uh, if this is a path to go, then how, how would you sort of like do it in, in a way that is interesting or at least meaningful? Yeah. And, and therefore maybe in that sense, decolonialism is still, uh, 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 pertinent in helping us sort of like think through uh, all the problematics that is associated with the museum, right? As an institution that has a lot of power in determining how we understand our past, what it choose to show, which sort of like determine a lot of the way how we understand our past. Uh, of course, bearing in mind that, you know, these, uh, we, each and every one of us will sort of take different things from it. Okay, uh, so I think perhaps the digital, uh, it's an extension, yeah, not a physical replacement of the museum. Yeah, but also there are also a lot of things that cannot be brought into the museum, right? So if, you know, if a house is brought into the museum, it's in a miniaturized sort of like form, uh, and it's not exactly the same as, uh, you know, having a house, right? Say if, if you are trying to create a kind of like mini taman, but at the same time, a mini taman is also not, the most, uh, it doesn't always convey the most sort of like authentic experience. You know? The spatial experience diorama, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think dioramas are something that we forget that used to be more popular because I think over time it tends to acquire a patina of age where it becomes a bit, you know, old school and people don't sort of like, people think it's a bit outdated uh, and especially when it's, you know, in design wise, then you can look a bit like, you know, uh, stuffy, right? Uh, but I think that's mm, eerie. Yeah, and eerie. But, okay, that's a very, yeah. uh, I think it's a bit of a charm to it too. Uh, and, and there is an uh, incredible amount of sort of artistry and creativity that goes into it. <laughs> but dioramas work uh, very well with children. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, us as well, I suppose, but with children, like, when I bring my children to the museum, they really love the diorama part. 
they will go from one scene to another scene, like trying to understand, oh, this is what happened, this is what happened. Like, you got really excited. Yeah, I mean, yeah. through the dioramas. But it does look dated. Yes, this is it. But it works. <laughs> yeah, it works on them, yeah, somehow. Yeah. Well, I mean, DR might be the next one here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, there's another question here. What do you think the issue or problems faced by national museums, given the quality of operations and state of their collection? Anyone wants to sort of take a stab at this? I feel like I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying too many bad things about. Uh, I think I think I can take the point of view of as a museum volunteer in the National Museum of Malaysia. I think. Uh, and, and also my research about the museum. I think one of the limitations to any museum is to be inclusive. Like everyone sort of uh, strives to be inclusive, but there is a limit to being inclusive or like inclusivity has a limit. So you can't include everything. And one of the ways I think the National Museum has done really well is uh, by setting up a museum volunteers department where Museum volunteers uh, can expand the interpretation of the, the museum that is already existing and also in a very interactive way, in a sense that, uh, in other words, it, it, it almost feels like the museum is talking to you, like through, through the voices of these museum volunteers. So I think that is like something that I really appreciate. Lah. Simon, Simon, do you mind if I share a, a thought? Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for your very detailed and very, what I call a very intimate uh, uh, collection of your, your own research and experience. So that in itself is uh, worth a study, you know, I think it's very nice. I want to share my observation about museums generally, because we're doing this project, you know, next door to our, our National Gallery. And, and, and my thought is this, uh, a lot of us think that museums are like, you know, we are in the crumbs and we are out of pocket and we go out begging for scholarship, funding and that kind of thing. But you think about the two great museums that we both know, right? Uh, let's say the, the Tate Museum in London and let's say the other one is the, uh, uh, the Bilbao, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and we, we, both of us are architects, so we know who Frank Gehry is and we know who her Dr. Moron is, right? So do you think museums are poor, uh, they are needy, and they are like crawling on their paws and trying to get funding? If they can hire these so-called uh, star architects, you know, and uh, they've got some of the best restaurants, the, some of the largest uh, bookstores. Uh, so I don't see why museum is on the begging end of, uh, of, of our social kind of uh, cultural framework of things. You know, if, if you think about museums being uh, commercially viable, uh, intellectually, uh, 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 in, you know, intellectually, uh, what's the word? Uh, invigorating kind of uh, cultural uh, exercises and it, it's profiteering and call it whatever you want. But the fact that these two big museums, and we don't, we don't want to name uh, the 160,000 museums that are in, in, in France alone. In Spain, there are 185,000 museums. Uh, so they're not museums for nothing, right? It's not like a charity drive. Uh, so we look at the state of our museum, it's look like they, are, they don't have enough money to even put a proper sign at the door entrance. Yeah? Uh, they use spray mount and like uh, super glue for, for, for announcing a major exhibition. And, and I'm not exaggerating actually, this, uh, I, I speak from first-hand experience. And, um, and so I think we need, if we are all interested in museology and we're all interested in archives and we're interested in artifacts, you know, and that's, that's why we are in this forum. But we really got to make some changes here in terms of our mindset about what museums ought to be and what it is for us, you know, how it speaks for us. Uh, we have to look at these so called examples abroad and, uh, and um, never mind all the private museums that are out there, but the half million private museums out there. But we're talking about uh, national uh, effort or national. Uh, public funding for our own museum. Uh, the two museums I quoted you are just very simple example. Let's not look at the Pompidou, for example, you know. Uh, I think museums cannot be seen as a poor man's job trying to save uh, bits and pieces, dusty pieces in the country, you know. It, it mustn't be seen like that. Um, we should uh, 
we should take it as a responsibility to preserve and uh, archive our heritage. And I think it's, uh, it, it should take it as, uh, I, I think it's social responsibility more than anything else. And, and I think future generations are at a losing end because uh, we're not doing very much to uh, uh, preserve uh, our artifacts you know, using, using the means that we actually have. And uh, we only have to look at these big two museums, examples that they didn't hire a graduate architect to do their buildings, you know. Uh, they picked the best and they had the best and, uh, and they, make, they make enough money to uh, uh, own their own bookstores and they do publications. They offer grants, they issue scholarships and they produce films. And, and so on and on and on, Simon, you know. So I yeah. just want to share my thought, that's all. I think since we have an audience here, I thought uh, it's time to reflect on, um, on our museum uh, in, in, this, in this kind of uh, I mean, uh, conversation. It, yeah. it, it, it is rather sort of like uh, this more, right? And I, I do agree with you on so many levels that uh, we, we should, and uh, we, we should really sort of like take on larger kind of social responsibility. But again, maybe uh, just to, uh, reflect a bit on what Dennis sort of raised just now is really this question of inclusion, right? Who's part of the conversation and uh, who has the degree of sort of like access uh, to this conversation. And I'm, I, I fear that, uh, you know, my level of access is I, I am able to sort of like reach this this much into the sort of like inner cabal and, and that's all I can sort of like go. Uh, 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 and it's a problem. Uh, uh, I, although I don't actually have an answer for it, except that maybe uh, the only uh, 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 thing I would add to uh, uh, your suggestion of looking to uh, either the Tate or Guggenheim as models is that even with these two examples, and then you bring in uh, France, is that they all operate within a very different kind of like funding structure and system. So France is mostly sort of like, you know, state funded and it operates in a different sort of like culture where even as a president, you're required uh, every time you sort of like become the, uh, the uh, is it prime minister or president of France, I don't remember, you actually have to initiate a cultural project and that's part of your mandate. And, and so it's so state-centered that everything is sort of like coming out of sort of state pocket, most of it are uh, very, uh, I mean, there are, of course, the luxury houses sponsoring events and stuff like that, but that's minimal in comparison to what the state is willing to spend. Uh, whereas in Spain, it's not even a government project, it's Guggenheim, it's American money. I, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, amongst that list, I don't even consider it as really a serious medium, uh, but in, uh, in Tate Modern, I think uh, you find an entirely different model where uh, heavily invest in trying to court uh, corporate sponsorship. So all your Koreans, uh, uh, Korean sort of like tycoons are paying like $2 million a year of, uh, to sit in the uh, paid exhibition, uh, acquisition board uh, where they are uh, privy to sort of like uh, uh, this club where they travel around the world together attending art fairs and being part of conversation and curators have to then sort of like massage their egos. And as a result of that, then they started collecting art and then they will start, you know, making recommendations on what to sort of like include in the tape collection. And as a curator who's being paid 20,000 pounds a year for your job, I don't know. I mean, it's a system that is pretty brutal and I think it's a system that's pretty inhuman. And I would like question like the integrity of an institution like Tate Modern uh, and really sort of like, uh, 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 you know, try to sort of maybe really find a different kind of like model. I think there might be a much more uh, human or, or a much more sort of like human model out there uh, to, to think about how we can sort of foster intellectual. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. That's the only bit that I do in the Malaysia case, then I, well, I, I don't even know where to start. If anyone has anything to uh, suggest. Uh, to, to be fair, I think, you know, they have interesting things and it's not like it's a complete sort of like lost cost. I think uh, uh, a, a, 
maybe a lot of it is sort of like uh, the incapacity to demonstrate some kind of like organizational leadership or, or having a kind of like leadership vision. Uh, and therefore, we always feel like it's not there and, and things are always sort of so messy and there's no institutional memory. Uh, when I was uh, last year, end of last year, the National Museum spoke to me and asked me, oh, do you have any, do you have a timeline of the Selangor Museum, which was the museum that existed before the National Museum? Apparently, they didn't have one. So I just went through my notes, constructed a timeline for them, did a layout of where all the objects used to be located. And then this, they told me that that was like the most extensive sort of like thing. And it was just me sort of like piecing together whatever archival documents that I have found. Uh, but I think it's this sort of the lack of coordination that's really the problem and that there is no institutional memory. So people of this generation don't know what the previous generation did. And, the, uh, and there's no sort of like passing down of knowledge from one cohort to another. And I think that is the huge problem here. Malaysia. We, we forget to. Thank you. Thank you for the your explanation. Any questions? Leadership problem. Yeah, you know, national museum goes all the way up to parliament. You're right, damn straight. What can we do? What can we do? Well, we can start our own museums or we can explore different formats. And I don't know if this is the best time to even uh, think of a house containing things as the most interesting kind of uh, uh, space to, to, en to engage with uh, culture, right? Uh, there's so many different other ways people are exploring. So we do have quite a number of independent ones, right? That Mm. Um, uh, not doing fairly well, but you know, uh, that's quite captivating. The mm. independent museums, uh, you know, run by NGOs, run by a group of, uh, you know, uh, people of, you know, specific interests. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like the, like, like the Kajang heritage, in a way, you know. Yeah, yeah, by, yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. I think it's quite amazing that they put that together, I find. Yeah, but it's, it's, but these are all independently kind of, you know, uh, achieved. Or, uh, you know, uh, we just, I, I, I suppose, I think what, what, what's saying, like, I think we just wish that, you know, our national museum is, is not in such a sorry state. Like, you know, it's... Mm. Well, one way of thinking about it is how money corrupts, right? I mean, think of like initial efforts of the National Museum. I mean, we, 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 we got off with a pretty good start. Uh, in the sense that we had no money back then, but people were resourceful, they were creative, uh, and they were problem solvers, and they were curious, and uh, they want to know, uh, and they, they built communities, and, uh, and it tried to be accommodating and inclusive. So the, there was a time where, you know, we had good foundations, but uh, somewhere along the line, maybe more things change. And I, uh, that's, that's a PhD thesis waiting to be written, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was funded by the UK National Law Group. Yeah. So I think our lottery money goes into funding schools, right? Uh, it funded Amno a while, but I think ultimately then most of it goes to into schools now, um, like uh, rural schools. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any last thoughts, last comments, uh, questions, anyone? Okay. I think, I think that's it, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I think it's a real pleasure, real pleasure to have you with us. Thank yeah, I um, mean, that was really enlightening, you know, very detailed, and kind of, uh, you know, history. And yeah. I think uh, if you want to ask any further questions or you have any sort of like thing, you want to, uh, you know, ask me, uh, you can always sort of uh, get my contact from Yusra. Uh, uh, I, you know, I share most of uh, my teaching materials online as well.
So if you, uh, you know, at the semester I'm teaching a Southeast Asian uh, pre-modern art course. Uh, so if you actually want to sort of like follow uh, the course materials as I share them, including all the lectures and stuff like that, you can go ahead to the link that I'm sharing on the screen. So uh, it's publicly accessible and anyone can sort of just follow at your own pace and learn at your own pace. Oh, okay, wait, there's one more last one here yeah. by Guma, if you don't mind. Malaysia's do collaborate. Well, you know, the problem is, you know, they collaborate. And, you know, I, I, I work in government, right? So I know how it works. There's KPIs. And on the surface, on, if you look at all the borangs that you're supposed to fill in, everyone will always achieve that KPI because you can always find a way to tick the boxes. Whether your engagement is meaningful or not, it doesn't matter as long as you have the numbers or, or tick those boxes. So if I were to say that there are museums in Malaysia, do they collaborate? Yes, they do. I'm sure that's one of the KPIs. International engagement, one of the KPI. Attending one of those e-commerce conference, that's definitely in the KPI. But how that translates into sort of like, you know, something meaningful is a different question. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's UK museums are free. Uh, some are, some are. Are not all. Uh, the big, the big ones are. I mean, Vienna is free. I mean, I, when I was there, it was free. I don't know now if they charge it again. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, oh, just some. Oh, not all. Exhibitions that are free, and then the special exhibitions they will soon make you pay lah. Like. Oh yeah, special exhibitions pay, but the fixed ones, yeah, you can go. Yeah, you can go for free. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think if you have a good content, people will be willing to pay for it. Uh, I'm sure there's like a hungry public who, who who's willing to sort of uh, spend good money for mm -hmm. good cultural content. But uh, maybe we're we're still not very good at sort of like communicating. Uh, what's interesting about an exhibition yet to, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, a wide variety of public rights. So learning that language requires right, maybe that, that, that's a skill in and of itself. And that's maybe something we need to also pay attention to. I don't know. Or in certain cases, like they only make it free, like, you know, from five to six. So then 4.30, there'll be a long queue or something. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, but not in UK, I can't remember, somewhere in Europe, yeah. Uh, so then, you know. Yeah, here when the Leonardo exhibition, of course, it was, I think it was very popular. Like the reproductions of Leonardo. Oh, the one, the one in KL? By yeah. The one in Bala, yeah. yeah uh, we met the curator recently. Uh, we, we met the um, uh, curator from Bala recently, and she said that was the most, uh, yeah, uh, successful one in recent times, but uh, there were a lot of damages done <laughs> yeah, exactly. to, the, to the other exhibits. Uh, so, you know, uh, that was ongoing at the same time. A, a lot was, you know, mm. uh, broken or, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, but it was successful. Mm. The, everybody wanted to see that, yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, it also comes from a culture where we are more familiar with like 3D museums where it's meant to be Pop interpreted. Culture. Right? Yeah. So, where you yeah, do things, uh, do a funny pose, like strike a funny pose and take a photo, this kind of thing. So maybe that's where people are coming from. Uh, it takes a bit of like, you know, uh, conversation. I think it's an opportunity for conversation more than education or teaching them. Rather than saying that you teach them how to do the right thing, I rather, I, I, rather, I think it's more important to sort of frame it as a conversation so that as a museum organizer, maybe you need to also then listen to you know, if people are interacting that way, is there a way to then sort of like change your medium design? Mm -hmm. or, uh, uh, and you might discover a sort of like new and more accommodating way of sort of showing your work compared, uh, rather than just sort of like, you know, borrow and copy things that you see overseas. I do. Uh, uh, those kinds of data things, I think, can, can be more sort of like you know, intelligently thought out. But personally, when I when I when I saw some of the pieces there, especially the Last Supper, I could say that um, the experience is uh, not 
it would never be as when you stand say, uh, two meters away from the original or maybe four meters away from the original. But what happened at the Balai was pretty close, I think, pretty close. Um, and so even if there was no uh, way that we can replicate the original to be arriving in Malaysia and all that, but it came pretty close. And I think uh, it was uh, it was a very blissful uh, moment for Malaysians to experience a Renaissance art at that kind of scale, you know. And we know it's all digital, but I think the experience, meaning if you're just standing next to a picture and then you, you kind of engage that image and whatever experience you can get from that, I think yeah. what they, I think what they achieved was pretty good. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't manage to go, but uh, that sounds. I mean, when you think about it, you know, there are only so few of us that can really, or would want to, or have uh, go all fly all the way to Milan to sort of look at the last one, right? Or can afford to do that. So, you know, this is a way to also democratize that. And even though it's not exactly. It's not an exactly replicable experience, at least it approximation. It comes pretty close, I suppose. Okay, all right. Uh, so I think that's it. Yeah, uh, to wrap. Yeah. Thanks. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice to meet you. Okay.